Uh, welcome everyone, thank you for coming. This is a great crowd. Um, I'd like to do the intro to the intro. So I will lead and Daniel will introduce Liz. Um, and uh, like many of us, I had the pleasure of meeting Liz in early December of last year um, when she came on board as the CEO and executive director of the Cosanti Foundation. While we met a number of times prior, we really got to talk during a memorable dinner at Dorm 10, um, our unofficial infamous lounge, <laughs> um, where the students and I had the pleasure of hearing more about Liz's background and story, including the first time that she visited our Cosanti while camping with friends. As an architect and educator, we certainly have a lot to talk about. And tonight we get to focus on Liz's achievements in this realm. Before I hand it over to Daniel to expand on Liz's bio, I first want to congratulate Liz for her recent 2022 award um, from the ASCA in the category of Best Micronarrative for the Journal of Architectural Education. Um, this award recognizes her research on the architecture of alterity it, uh, cited in Beirut. Liz joins an impressive group of renowned educators in receiving this prestigious award. At TSOA, we feel very lucky to work with you, uh, Liz, and we're extremely excited about our current and future collaboration. Um, with that, I'll hand it off to Daniel um, to further introduce you. And um, as an introduction to the introducer, um, <laughs> Daniel is a Lebanese American writer, historian, educator, and multimedia artist, as well as our spring teaching fellow for history and thesis. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. Tonight we're having a lecture under a theme of global narratives. Our esteemed lecturer tonight is our own CEO and Executive Director of the Cosanti Foundation, Elizabeth Martin Malikian. Liz Martin Malikian, uh, her research addresses the post war city in the Levant, which is the area that encompasses modern day Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, and Palestine. Liz is also a tenured professor at the um, professor and chair of the thesis department of architecture at Kennesaw Un State University, and her lecture tonight will explore the notion of otherness. Um, her work examines an all too often overlooked issue concerning the overlapping issues of oneness within otherness. Liz's work underscores the intertwined alterity and hybridity that is ever present in, within the Levant. I'm hoping, Liz, that your lecture tonight will shed some light on where the hell I'm from. Yes, <laughs> because, <laughs> because I would um, love some clarity, too. <laughs> Liz's unique background encompasses art, architecture, and academics, a rare combination that aligns fully with the unique mission of the Cosanti Foundation. Originally from New York, Liz has more than 30 cumulative years of experience as a practicing and principal architectural designer, and more than 15 years of experience as an academic practitioner. She has taught domestically and internationally as a professor of architecture as well as urban design. Her lifelong commitment to her profession and to the creative community is evident in her service of, uh, as part of dozens of commitments, committees, councils, including the Urban, urban Land Institute, Women's Leadership Initiative, the Metropolitan Public Art Commission, and the AIACC Monterey Design Conference Committee. Most recently, Liz has been awarded an L NEA Challenge America grant she has received a variety of honors of late, um, such as the AIA ACSA Practice and Leadership Award in 2019, AIAS Educator of the Year Award in 2020, the ULI Atlanta the Leaders 2021 Cohort, and most recently she received the Journal of Architectural Education Writing Award. Without further ado, thank you very much, Liz. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> All right. There we go. Thank. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. I appreciate the invitation and um, the dinner beforehand and all the celebratory um, 
uh, support um, that I've received so far. And um, I'm just gonna see how to move this now. Oh, there we go. So one of the things I've been really looking at and exploring in the last several years, and it's kind of like a newer way of me looking at architecture, is something called architecture of alterity. And the architecture of alterity is something that um, begins to look at the notion of a third relationship. And so there's the relationship of self and other and then the space in between. And so it really is built on the philosophical notion of Emmanuel Levinas, who thought of this space as a communication and activity space. So communicativity um, is a way of looking at things. So how do people interact within spaces and how do you make it so that you can be in the built environment and really understand another person? So Levinas is um, space of uh, communicativity and the idea of this third space is that you will never really understand someone unless you really um, accept them and bring them in. And unless you bring someone in in their space of um, existence, then you are just really this self living in a world that you really aren't going to understand your, your spaces around you. And so it's really looking at ideas of um, how do you look at spaces of connect, um, communicativity. And so I ended up, um, during a sabbatical while teaching, um, uh, taking on um, uh, teaching through the Columbia University Global Networking um, Program, a pop-up Studio X. And so what the Studio um, X program in Columbia is, where they, they have a series of studios all around the world, and one's in Amman and one's in also Istanbul, but they didn't have one in Beirut. So I ended up just calling them up and saying, I'm going to Beirut and I want to do this research and there's no way this white woman can just show up by herself and like start doing research, I don't think. Um, I need a, a calling card. And so is it possible for me to do a pop-up Studio X? And so the person that um, was in charge of Studio X in Amman is a, you know, an amazing um, researcher and she's an Israeli citizen. If you know much about Beirut, um, you can't, pretty much it's a truce, but the state of Israel and the state of Lebanon are at war, and so you cannot freely go from one to the other. And if you go to Israel, then you are not allowed in Lebanon. If you go to Lebanon and it's in your passport, you are never, ever allowed in Israel. So at a point, you kind of have to choose one. And so that made it so that I was able to get a case to be able to take this on. And so um, three of the things that I really um, uh, proposed them that I wanted to look at was um, specifically at this post-war juncture at Beirut where the city was still somewhat divided. I um, ended up also doing some research at University of Edinburgh where a group of people were looking at divided cities. So someone was looking at Mostar, someone was looking at um, Belfast, Mostar, um, a, a series of others, Jerusalem and Beirut. So, um, it, the, and then we were gonna compare all of these cities. And so three things that I was really trying to look at were um, individuals of different religions and communities in Beirut have different interpretations for the image of the city and perceive it based on their various acquired social memories. The second is individuals, while divided in various religious communities in the city of Beirut, are socially and spatially connected to each other. Urban interventions can strengthen the, this relationship between place and image, preserving with that the specificity of the space and its social collective memory. So this, these are the three things that I went and said I wanted to go and look at. Um, and granted, I went in with kind of a very um, book way of looking at place without really knowing how to experience this particular place. And so this is just a map of what the global network partnerships at Columbia University are. And how it ends up working is you go to a place and you set up within somebody's storefront and you actually inhabit someone's office and you have programs, you um, belong and, and bring in neighborhood groups. And um, one week out of the year, they call it X week, and students from Columbia University fly into this space that you've created and they create a project. And so they can choose any of these dots that are on there. And so the year that I did it, it was um, uh, in the area in the center. And it was really just about a year that it was there, which is why it was called a pop-up, and then, then it was gone. 
Um, so these are some of the things that I put together and I kind of based it on storytelling. Like how do you go in and develop a narrative of the city? How do you understand a city from a voyager, an outsider coming in? And so I ended up um, going through and doing a series of talks with different creative thinkers. So one of the talks I had like a, someone who is a researcher in um, genetics along with a filmmaker and a writer and then an architect and kind of posed a question. We had a dinner similar to what we had prior to this with this but together and got in a conversation about things. And it's a way of really kind of understanding the place, understanding the culture and doing an exchange um, of information between Western thought and Eastern thought. And so what I was really um, touched with or, or struck by um, in terms of Beirut and it, I had been there before um, but I'd only been there for a week and it was very structured seeing family and things like that and um, I really saw just the part I was supposed to see and I was really interested in all the other parts of the city and so um, one of the the areas and if you know much about Beirut it had been in civil war and so it was really known to me as like a city of contrast. So it was really looked at as a battleground and a playground. And to me, this is a picture that really shows my perspective of a, a tourist coming in and what, what I was allowed to see. And so behind there is the Phoenician, which used to be in the heydays, one of the most famous buildings that, you know, the Kennedys would go and stay at Liz Taylor, hang out by the pool. And that, now it was kind of like, well, the pool and the outdoor spaces were there and people hung out and you ended up, you still found a way of living within this post-conflict city that felt like you could have some kind of life within it. Um, but to me, this was like really looking at an idea of hedonistic urbanism, where you're looking at the idea of finding pleasure within the city, but you're trying to figure out what exactly that means. And so in front of where I ended up staying, I stayed um, on the on one side and um, in called Mar Mikhail. And it, um, if you know much about the history now, about a year or two ago, there was a bomb in the port that blew up um, kind of accidentally, and that happened to be in the neighborhood I was staying in, so I was kind of glad I wasn't, that I was actually there um, prior to that point. But outside my window, I saw a Banksy um, a graphic, which I think really shows what the place is about. And you can see there are two militia men that are um, spray painting um, an idea of peace. And so when I would walk through the city, I would walk through by myself from one side to the other. And um, every block, there was either, um, there was a series of militiamen and these gatekeepers that would go through. And they all had machetes like that. And they, after a while, they got to know you. They knew your name. And then they became very familiar. And uh, they were part of guarding and, and keeping the city safe. But they were also people that lived in the community. And so they ended up knowing you. And so this example of me taking a picture of someone showing me their gun and taking it out of the holster, and another one smoking, and then you sit down and they'd give you a cappuccino, and then you'd go to the next place. It was a really interesting way of dealing with things. And so this was um, one of the things uh, to sort of look at. And so um, Going through and looking at this, the last one where interventions, urban interventions, really look at place and image and ideas of how people begin to express themselves through the use of interventions. And so one of the people, um, Nadia, um, ended up um, doing this installation in a public park and she ended up buying about 2,000 toilets. And she ended up putting them in a park and putting them in a grid. And it was very spatial. It was incredibly beautiful from my perspective. And you could see um, what it looks like here from the, from the air. And people would go in as if it's public space and start sitting down. They start having picnics. Um, it was a place to kind of inhabit. But her whole point was um, doing, um, trying to create order in the middle of chaos. And her point was also like, I'm just tired of living in the shithole of an area that's someone else's battleground. I want to actually be able to live here. And that was her point. And so there, I started to end up meeting and um, sort of pulling out this idea of this gender um, women um, sort of expressed um, power that ended up um, really controlling the narrative, which I found really interesting and something I had never 
been exposed to that was so clearly. So um, on spray painted on the ground, she ended up saying, haven't 15 years of hiding in the toilets been enough? And so she grew up during the Lebanese civil wars. And so while she was a child and going to school when there were bombs, what they were told was to go into the bathroom as a child and stand on the toilet and hide your head until the bomb went by. And so this is her memory of growing up. And so I just found this really interesting. And then it was in the nighttime, they ended up having parties, and then there were raves, there were film festivals, there were ended up being political talks. Um, and uh, to me, it was a really interesting way of looking at um, public, urban, and private space and how they kind of melted the two together. So normally you would think of a toilet or something, a bathroom as being part of a residential private space, and yet when it becomes part of a public space, it really re begins to redefine the use of it and the intent of it. So my understanding of what a bathroom is is a place of safety, privacy, in this particular environment is quite different. And so I found it really interesting if you take something like that and put it in a different environment, how it changes the meaning and changes the use of it. And so this is the artist. Um, and so as a, um, since I was a professor and teacher, I ended up going back and teaching this as one of my studios and um, ended up teaching a stu an urban studio. And so this is a map of Beirut. And if you know the, how the geography works, it's at the end of the Mediterranean and it's um, really hilly and has this really be beautiful view of the golden, and beautiful blue water. And then there's a hill behind it, or mountains behind it. And so um, when the early settlers would come by, or Western settlers, the, the ones that were colonizing everybody, ended up going by, they called it the Switzerland of the Middle East because it was just so beautiful with the mountains. Um, and so we ended up breaking it down into um, six different categories and looked at branding, ecology, heritage, social economy, and political, and how to begin to look at re, um, reconstructing um, the city after um, this war time. And if you look at this area where everything's kind of going toward, um, I guess the mouse doesn't work, but up by the, the mouth of the area, that's where the downtown was. And it was a space where it was a space of coexistence. There were these souks where everyone would go shopping, depending on whatever your background was, if you're wealthy or poor, everyone interfaced together. And this was what the quality of life was. And it was very similar to many port cities along the Mediterranean. After the war, what ended up happening was um, a whole bunch of people that ended up owning the area, ended up creating deals and tying together land, and I'd say maybe 20% of it was demolished because of the war, but post-war they ended up demolishing 80% of it to be able to come in and rebuild the whole area and making it much more Western. And so it ended up being interesting from an architect's perspective because Stephen Hall designed something, Mineo, a lot of um, uh, John Nouvelle, a lot of really famous architects came in and they wanted to coin it so that people would trust being able to come back the ancient city of the future. And so they kept a little bit of the old, but they made a lot of it new. So where the old souks, where it was an open market and it was a space of coexistence, ended up being a place that was much more of what, how we would understand shopping or a mall. It was much more enclosed. Um, it ended up um, really trying to attract a lot of money because if you know much about Beirut, it's very similar to... Um, Switzerland where they have a, a kind of a clause in the banking where they don't have to report so much and so it was called the banking capital and it is the banking capital of the Middle East. So all the money is in the Middle East is pretty much kept in this area of the country. Um, and so they wanted to be able to track that and have trust in terms of bringing the economy back. And so from a branding perspective and an urban perspective it made a lot of sense from that way but what it ended up doing is really changing the culture so where this area where everything is in um, dark uh, where all the lines are going thing everything that was in white where all the residential areas work it really started to separate where people lived and the residents to where everyone who was wealthier and would visit um, would go and so rather than it being really a space of coexistence it ended up being a true divided city and so um, 
we ended up putting together these six core principles where maybe one should start looking at the idea of the city. And one was um, adaptability, um, where cities need to adapt and be flexible because the only constant is change. That things need to be accessible, and so connectivity amplifies the benefits for everyone. There has to be stewardship, which is good plans make for good neighbors. Identity, which means design grows from the essence of place, not something where everything looks the same. It should be based on culture. Um, it should be based on climate. And then experience, that people fall in love with places and not principles. That you identify with the place, not with just the sterile kind of idea of principles, but that it should be really tied to culture, history, um, and uh, uh, things like that. Um, and then it should be affordable. It shouldn't be a big divide between um, where there's um, money that comes in and then the other residents that support the, ci that support the city end up having to live someplace else. The design is not for the 1% and education all should also be accessible to all. And so we ended up sort of developing these core principles um, and going and talking to people and going back and interfacing um, with people that lived in the community and um, having this big board that ended up being about you know 20 feet long and taking photographs and interfacing to try and figure out what these principles were about. Um, and this is kind of what it ended up looking like. Um, and then developed each one of these lines in a series of plates and develop them together to start to understand the notion of place. So then going back, if you, you go into this environment, especially at this time where it's post-conflict, and um, to me what was really interesting is when I, when I arrived, the first thing I was told to do um, before they even cared to look if I had a visa or anything, um, the security at the airport just said, do you have the Beirut app? And I'm like, what do you mean? And they're like, well, you know, there's a brownout. It's rolling brownouts. Every six hours you get electricity. And then six hours you don't get electricity. And then you get electricity for six You're going to need to know that. So there's an app for that. And so I got it at the airport. So it told me with my address when I would have services and when I wouldn't. So that you could actually plan. And then when I arrived, they're like, well, you know, we've reached a point where there's so much damage, although it looks, you know, it's, it's, a, a, um, a very established culture, there was no water. So, I mean, nobody had water So you from, from the city. So if you, where I got used to, I turn on the faucet and water would just come out and just assume I pay a bill, I get water. They're like, no, you actually have to purchase it from someplace else so that it's really um, clean. And, you know, you're lucky that you're living on this block because the queen owns it. And I'm like, well, who's the queen? And I'm, I'm renting an Airbnb. And they're like, the queen owns like five of these blocks. And so she has an in with all these services. So you, she'll get you anything you want because you've got the connection, which was absolutely 100% right. So once a month, this big tank would show up. They built this thing above the kitchen, up on, up on the high, and that's where all my water would come from. And so it was, to me, it was really interesting where I was from an area where I taught sustainability and I took things for granted. And I went to this high culture place where it, because of war time, it, post-war time, it really was um, a whole different lifestyle and a way of adapting to it. Um, so basically as a Westerner, when you hear Beirut, you just think war. And, um, and if you go through the area, it, was, um, it went from the 70s to the 90s. And during wartime, um, this is a, this I got from the CIA website um, yesterday. And it's the neighborhoods in 1986. Um, and you can see um, here where there's a green line through it. And so the green line is during wartime where the city got divided from West Beirut and East Beirut. And what happened is just terms of safety where everything was merged together and it was a very open society. Um, it ended up through safety that you ended up actually um, cloistering with people of similar backgrounds. And so it ended up being divided religiously. So the West Beirut was the Muslim side and East Beirut was the Christian side. And in between was the green line. The green line was essentially this neutral zone that divided the two. 
And um, after many, many years, because the war went on for many years, it actually literally became green. It was, it was um, ended up having all these trees and this area that got divided. And it was on Damascus Street. And it went all the way from the mountains all the way up to the Mediterranean. It ended up being, you know, essentially referred to as the spot of fear or the no man's land. And you can see here, there's some people there and it's um, what they're doing actually is their brothers, one married a Christian woman and one married a Muslim woman. So they had to divide it up, the families got divided, but they would end up meeting there. And sometimes they would meet just to exchange supplies. So here they're exchanging, one of the brothers had water and the other one had lemons and, and meat to eat. So they would meet and exchange supplies. Um, and, but during wartime, they lived separately and they really couldn't coexist. And it became a really different way of thinking. And so where I ended up staying, I stayed on the east side. I stayed in an Armenian village in a building that was primarily um, Christian Armenians. Um, well, most all, all Armenians are. And um, it ended up, so I did the same. I was told, if you go, you have to stay with where someone are going to identify with you or you won't be accepted. And, or you there will be distrust and you're not there long enough if you really want to do something. And so I ended up, um, there was an older woman next door in her 80s and she um, lived with her brother. And every Wednesday at noon, she would open her house up and have tea. And so she would knock on the door. And if I didn't go over, it meant there was something wrong. You know, like, why, why are you not being a part of the community? So I would go over and meet with them. And then the next Wednesday, the next Wednesday, and um, she ended up like opening up and showing me pictures of her family and her stories. And um, she brought down all these photographs and, it, um, she, and her brother would come out and, um, and sit and have tea as well. And she would say, yes, I'm here, you know, I'm taking care of my brother. He's 92 and he's having trouble walking, he's in a wheelchair. And I'm in my 80s and it's just appropriate. This is the way it is. I'm living in my brother's house because I'm single and I'm still waiting. So she was essentially in her 80s still waiting to get married. It was very cute. And she ended up telling a story that during the war she had this lover, but he was of the wrong religion. And they were about to get married. The war took place. They had to separate. And they would meet, but they never got married. And then he ended up, through the survival of the family and supplies and things like that, marrying somebody um, that was on um, the Western side. And so she never got over it, but she keeps waiting that something's going to happen, someone else is going to show up, or she thinks he's going to show up. And she said what was really interesting is all these women um, got together in, her, in the area to um, just exchange supplies and things like that. And then they do just reached a point where they just got tired of the restriction. And she also wanted to go to the other side to see her lover. And so, but the thing that's interesting is the green line, that area was, was the most dangerous area during the war. Um, it's where all the checkpoints were. It's if you ever read all the things where people were getting kidnapped, people were shot and then never found, it always happened during the green line, that no man's zone. And she said they started to do a thing where all these women got together and they said just to express their freedom, they took a tamasa, and they, tamasa in um, uh, Arabic is called to walk for pleasure. So they would get dressed up as if they were going on a, on a trip or, or a weekend and they'd put their makeup on and, and bombs are going off and they would just singularly, each one was assigned a day and they would walk across the green line just as a statement. And I found this really, really fascinating, that this um, idea of expression of freedom during this time was about that. And I was reading a lot of um, uh, Lefebvre, and he writes things um, about these three different ways of looking at space. And the first space is called the perceived space, or spatial practice. And the second space is the conceived space, or representations of space. And the third space is the lived space, or spaces of how you inhabit them. And I found this a really interesting way of looking at the city and especially this condition that I was being exposed to. And so this spe uh, the perceived space, according to Lefebvre, um, who's uh, French, so this is a translation, so it might be a little um, rocky, but um, the space is a product of human design, urban planning and spatial organization, and it answers the, the what question, meaning what urban interventions can strengthen the relationship between place and image. 
And then conceived space is the space that contains the abstract, the imagined space, as well as the visual order, signs, and codes of the city, dominated by political rulers, planners, and economic interests. So the conceived space are all the restrictions and the policies that make us inhabit it the way we're supposed to inhabit it. And then the lived space is the space that describes how people inhabit everyday life, the way we create cities as users through practices, images, and symbols. And so then started to look at how, where, and what, and how this ended up working in this particular environment that I was um, living in as a way to make sense of it and de develop this kind of mind map of what that was about. And so this woman ended up showing me photographs. Um, every Wednesday I would go and she'd share another piece of the story. And so these are through where the checkpoints are. So in the bottom part, you can see the tank and just a few people walking through. And so above it are some of these women that would go on these walks to go um, walk to the other side. They could go to the supermarket or get supplies across the street or in their neighborhood, but they were making this point, I'm gonna go across the, the other side to, to have an, a semblance of everyday life. And also what was interesting is the Associated Press and International Press hired five famous photographers one Italian, one Swiss, um, one Lebanese that was living in Paris, which is very common, including you. Um, and they paid them to go live there and document things that were happening in the war. And so this war is very incredibly well documented from a day-to-day -day perspective of how people inhabited it. And so this is the um, crossing, the Beber House crossing in 1982. And then above it, you see these women that are walking with their supplies back and forth. And so there's um, a Lebanese um, poet, um, and he wrote something called The Prophet in 1932. And surprisingly, it's one of the most um, well, um, the, the well purchased book in the world. Um, and it's been around for quite some time. And he has something called The Freedom Song, one of his poems. And um, its whole idea is how he defines pleasure. So from his perspective, coming from this environment or being exposed to it, is that um, a freedom song is not freedom. It is the caged taking wing. And so it reminded me a little bit of these women um, that would take a tamasa to walk for pleasure, where to them it was really um, about freedom. And so pleasure to them was really defined as freedom. And so they would get dressed up. They would walk through. This is the neighbor, but this was her, you know, 40 years earlier. And um, she would walk through and, and she'd walk right by the militia. And, the, and they were supposed to be stopped, but there was so much pride in the fact that they were challenging the establishment that they just had their own rules and everyone allowed them to do what they wanted. And um, they started to ha even have pride in the way men would whistle at them. Um, and then they would challenge, you know, the way they got dressed up to be able to express that, you know, and it felt like a sort of point of normalcy. And it was also quite dangerous. You can see this photograph of this one woman doing it on her own and doing her freedom walk on her assigned day. Um, and this is in 1991. Um, and to me, this was just a really fascinating condition that had happened that I was really unaware of and found nothing written about it. Nothing was in any newspapers. Um, so it was kind of unraveling and unearthing and reinterpreting the urban scar in post-war um, Beirut. And someone I admire quite a bit is Labius Woods, who's looked a lot um, at Mostar, um, at another divided city and how... Um, post-war um, architecture can help heal. And so um, one of his quotes is, the scar is a deeper level of reconstruction that fuses the new and the old. The scar is a mark of pride and honor, both for what has been lost and what has been gained. And so I find what is really interesting is the whole rebranding of Beirut um, with this modern city in the port area. It's called the ancient city of the future but no one's ever acknowledged in that branding the present. And so I found it really interesting that these women that went on a Tomasa were the ones that were acknowledging the present. And so that, um, I guess, is, is my, my talk for the day. So it's called Civic Callings, Restoring the Past and Claiming Rights to the Present. Thank you.
So you guys have any questions? <laughs> yeah, well, that was a fantastic talk, a really great story. Oh, Thank you thanks. so much. Um, with the story in mind, I wonder, with your studio from Colombia, what did that studio look like in Beirut? And what did, how did you turn all of this into a studio? Um, it was really looking at how do you reconstruct post-war city base and questioning and critiquing the fact that it became very Western and that it really looked like any place, like you didn't actually feel like you were there. So how do you unearth um, the people that live there and how do you make it so that maybe they feel like they can be a part of the, their city mm -hmm. and actually afford their city as well. Okay. So part of it is just really looking at the notion of how do you come from a Western bias and start to understand the other and not critique it as it's such a foreign thing. And um, Edward Said refers to it as Orientalism, mm -hmm. where you sort of romanticize about these beautiful Middle Eastern women. So like the Kardashians, Kardashians are, are um, Lebanese Armenian. Mm -hmm. And so th this is what people look like. I mean, they're absolutely gorgeous. The food's amazing. And um, so the romanticized nation of it. So like the photograph of the woman in the bikini, you know, smoking a hookah with a thing, that's a very orientalist way of looking at things. So how do you come and look at the city where you're actually acknowledging the place and not bringing your bias with you, that you're actually really beginning to understand the other? I think is really sort of the, the learning of it. Um, what the design result was is really sort of secondary. Mm -hmm. What yeah. did that look like on a day-to-day -day with your students? Well, it was only for a week, so they oh. come. So basically, they come for Studio X, and so they come for a week, and um, they came with a professor that teaches too. So in a way, I was cast in the the area where you curate. So you set everything up. You've already made the contacts. You get them into places um, to understand it. You bring lecturers in, and they start to really identify with the place from the ground up. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of ripping the bandaid off and saying, "This is how it, mm -hmm. how life is." Yeah. How are they able to financially have this grow? What is their income in Braverman? Um, you mean people that live there? Yeah. Um, what tends to happen, and uh, to use the example of the brother and sister that were living next door, they sent their children away to Paris and Canada to get educated, and the children never came back, and they send money home. So that's one. Two, there's the old rent and the new rent. So as an Airbnb, I was paying new rent. And so I came in and paid the landlord, um, and because I was an American coming in, I had to pay everything up front. But I paid 1,000 a month. It was a really good neighborhood. I had a view of the Mediterranean, I had four rooms, I had a Venetian um, light in each, I mean, it was beautiful. Um, and it came with everything, like an Airbnb. The brother and sister next door paid old rent. They paid $70 a month. And it was restricted. So if you lived there, you were godfathered into old rent. And so that's how many people who have been there and survived and stayed through the war are able to survive. But then the issue, um, if you even know, the, uh, like I had a rent control apartment in San Francisco. And there's rent control apartments in Los Angeles and New York. What happens is then they're not kept up. If you want a new kitchen or you kind of do it yourself because no one's going to do it. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's so the infrastructure ends up not being upgraded, but so how they're able to survive is the, the, the laws of the old rent and the new rent. Well, the, the city itself, well, what do they have as an income? What do they, do they export or what do they, how do they uh, have financially survive? Banking? Um, tourism, agriculture, so it's very um, fertile ground, so they're known, their wine, they're, they have some of the best wine. So it's very similar to Napa and part of Southern California. They have olive oil, um, uh, grapes, um, so agriculture, tourism. So it's an area that's always been similar to a lot of port cities, incredibly liberal. The law, there's really, it's kind of like anything goes, laws and things like that. And so it's in a, surrounded by several countries that are very conservative and restricted. So people fly in and 
do whatever they shop like and um, party like crazy and so it ends up being kind of like um, so there's an example of a, a nightclub called um, B018 and it to me is like really the epitome of the culture of Beirut when I've gone there several times and so an architect um, Bernard Quarry designed it and it was in the port area and it was a sunken um, he did it in an area that um, was on a part during the war that had a massacre. And so it ended up being where a lot of refugees lived. And uh, someone had come in and pretty much desecrated everyone that lived there. And it was an area during the war that nobody went there because it was just, it was almost became a sacred ground of just the travesties of how humans can treat each other. And so um, they ended up wanting to put something there. And so um, they ended up putting a nightclub of all things. And so it ended up being a circle and it had two ramps that went down and the big circle area would open up at night. And um, the hillside where all the, the houses were would look down and see on this mirror and reflect it and when you were down below in the nightclub, you would see the city looking down on it. But if you were to drive by, you it was it was like a thing that wasn't there. And in the nighttime, all you would hear is like boom, boom, boom. You would hear life. And so the, it was a um, a living like kind of monument, uh, an acknowledgement of the war since it hadn't been acknowledged. And so a lot of people go to just express, say, this is a neutral space where I can express myself. So I ended up going with someone that was in the office that I was staying with and two um, Muslim women that, you know, had, you know, very um, uh, stricter um, ideas of how to dress in public and had covered up. And at like two in the morning, I'm walking down the ramp with them and on the way down, they're like stripping all their stuff down there. It's like, and then when they went back out, you became who you were supposed to be in the urban space. So in a way that particular space to me really epitomizes um, the notions of hedonistic urbanism and pleasure within a city and how people can live together and exist. And it was the way they were, was. Yeah. I, can, I can attest to that. Um, it was also near where the war started. I haven't really connected those yet. <laughs> um, I guess here it's, um, I think when people come here to experience Arcasante, there is already an understanding and openness. So um, I hadn't really exactly thought about the connection, but that's actually kind of an interesting one. Um, <laughs> Um, in the vein of like the idea of the third space, like what yep. role does architecture have in playing in like mending, like and being the bridge between war, those two like war torn halves? Does that make sense? Yeah, I th I mean I think an example of the third space is this um, nightclub, for example, mm -hmm. because it's not just the experience of it and the sounds of life when life was taken away. Yep. It's the notion of the interaction, the physical and visual interaction between the city and the um, experience that you're having um, and how they're always forced to stare and confront at each other. And so to me, that is a perfect example of a design kind of third space. So essentially in that I hear like creating spaces for people to gather in a way that does like mend those relationships. It is, but I think it's also to confront the other. So while you're there, you're always seeing something else. 
and you're aware of the other um, while you're experiencing it. So it's not just from your perspective. So you understand the other, but then you incorporate that and that becomes that third thing. Gotcha. Yeah. Liz, what year were you in Beirut? 2015. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and if, um, if you were to go back, how, what would you look for next, just considering the different types of crises that Beirut has gone through since 2015, from the garbage strike to the yep. explosion to the pandemic, how do you think that changes your research? Or would I th well, I know exactly the answer because I walked into this with a whole thing that I'm going to explore hedonistic ar um, urbanism and start writing a book called Hedonistic Urbanism. And now that's like completely inappropriate <laughs> to even like coin it that way. And so even though my perspective of that isn't that you just go and party, um, it's the notion of, I mean, this is the time in the nighttime is when everyone can come together after work and sort of coexist and they're finding moments in the past but I think in a way it's really looking at an architecture of alterity but also um, looking at the ecology of it becomes really important because the idea that the reason why the garbage crisis happened was because the landfills were filled and then there was no place to put anything and so that is going to happen every place else as well the water situation is going to be similar um, and it's not considered a third world. And so to me, that's kind of really fascinating. And so looking at kind of like an eco alterity is something I think I would probably start to look at. Cool. Yeah. I, just, I really want you to write that book. Um, ah. <laughs> that's, that's fascinating when you showed the picture of the woman in the bikini and her yeah. like a, with like the bombed but it's not on the background. That's fascinating. How did you arrive at that term? What what got you there? The which one? Hedonistic urbanism. Oh, hedonistic urbanism. Um, the first person to coin that term is Rem Coolhouse. Oh, of course. And he did that in um, uh, the, the New York book. Um, and so he had a particular way of looking at that, and that came out in a particular year. It came out the same year that Edward Said wrote or Orientalism. Mm -hmm. And I found the connection that they were thinking those two things at the same time a really interesting connection. And so that's where I kind of came up with that. Yeah. That kind of links to my one question, which is about uh, the Lebanese relationship to death. What do you think is the relationship between otherness and death in Lebanon? Um, I think. Um, I will say that I took a lot of chances when I was there and I walked a lot of places and the transportation system you take services which is you just it's no there's people that have cars it's before you know Uber you know that kind of notion but it's not structured so someone drives up and you just wave your hand and say will you take me to the other side of town and they're like yeah sure and it costs one dollar one US dollar and then other people hop in and then you'll and that's kind of how you navigate the city. There's also a bus system that nobody takes and I learned how to take the bus system um, and then I would walk. So I was on East Beirut and I had where I did most of my um, events or happenings or places where I worked was closer to the university and it was really three miles, but um, at that time there were two lights, traffic lights. And so to cross a road, you had to learn how to cross a road where nobody's stopping ever. And they're going really fast. <laughs> um, and so I, I don't know, cause I, I think, I, I mean, I would walk home at two in the morning by myself and the militia guys were just like, what are you nuts? And one sometimes one would walk me home, you know, and it would just be there, just like, why are you out in the city by yourself? And I'm like, this is the safest place I think I have ever been. It's so regulated, like nothing ever happens. Like nothing ever happens. No one steals, like nothing. Um, when you say regulated, do you mean control? Yeah, by the militia. Like, okay. like it's, um, uh, and it's meant to, um, 
be more of a, a, a post-war making sure that things don't happen so a war starts you know it's um so you, it's like i call it post post-war but it really isn't post-war because they're still in war they're just kind of in a truce and so every so often like little things happen you know like a bomb shows up and you know that kind of thing um so i i don't know because um at the time um i i was there and i, I was my husband's name was charlie and i was just like you know, you can't not come. That's they're going to think that's really weird. I mean, you're also you're Lebanese. Like it's just weird. You have to come. And he's, I have no desire to go there ever again. We left in the middle of the night. You know, and I haven't been back. And I I have memories like you. You know, at the checkpoint, I, I just have no desire. Like, but you should come. And then I was in an archive, and um, someone goes, your last name's Malikian? Do you know Joe Malikian? I go, no. And so I call him, I'm like, do you know Joe Malikian? And he's like, oh, yeah. Those are the relatives that live over there. And, you know, there was a falling out. And I'm like, did you know they paid for the whole entire archive here? <laughs> and so now I, like, have carte blanche. I can do, like, anything I want in here as if, like, I own it. Like, I go, I think, so I reconnected with, like, parts of families that weren't, weren't talking and so I got him to come and so he shows up and um, I said okay well I have to go on the other side of town and do like these four hours of things and he's like well I'm gonna sleep in and I go okay great so I lock the door and it's the old Italian like 1902 locks and so you lock it one way and it locks from the inside but if you go all the way around which I didn't know at the time you lock it from the inside too and so I locked him in and so I left I did my thing totally like oblivious and then I'm walking back, I'm a mile away from the house, and like store owners are coming out and they're like, hey, how's it going? Here's some hummus. You're like, oh, would you like this bottle of wine? And I'm like, what's going on? And then I'm getting closer to the house, and like, you know, like, and this is like, it took me like an extra half hour. And then um, I'm getting like right at the apartment I'm about to walk in, and the guy who has the, this, the uh, restaurant below comes out and he says, yeah. I've been arguing with my wife, you know, she's not Lebanese, not at all. She couldn't possibly be, and she has no understanding of men whatsoever, or her husband, because, you know, she, she's totally not in control. And then it happened that they were just like, she definitely knows how to control her man. She locked him in. <laughs> and it was like everyone knew. They were just like, she really understands culture and how to t keep her family together because she was just like, I'm going to be gone and I'm going to keep you safe. And I was just like, okay. So I don't know if that tells you anything about death, but it was like connection, knowing where people are. So suddenly, it, like everything changed within like an hour. And how people knew, like a mile ahead. And I was coming home with all this stuff, and I was and I was completely accepted because of that one instance. <laughs> so, anyway. I bet you we have cousins. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you guys for listening. <laughs>